So, hey, everybody, and welcome to this Oxen Community AMA. We're going to be here to talk about the recently announced session token swap program, uh, inclusive of the Oxen coin claims and the service note bonus, as well as a bunch of other stuff which was discussed alongside that announcement. I am here with all of the heavy hitters from Oxen. I have with me the CEO, Chris McCabe, our CTO, Key Jeffries, our chief software architect, Jason Rhinelander, and of course, last but not least, our CMO, Josh Joseph Smith. Uh, so this is gonna run pretty much like every other community AMA that you've probably seen from us. We're gonna run through some questions which you have so lovingly sent in to us. We're gonna address them in as much detail as we can, and we're gonna also get through as many as we possibly can. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to get through every single question. There have been some double ups, uh, we've gone through and tried to figure out which questions are the most important or asked multiple times uh, or which just seem very important to address. Uh, so without further ado, let's jump right on into it. So the first question I have here is for you, Chris, uh, and it is about runway. How much runway does the OPTF actually have and what is your runway goal? Cool. All right. So my runway goal is is is, is big uh, because I want to go big and I want us to achieve some really amazing big things on a global scale. Um, but in terms of where we sit right now, we have a decent allocation of chain flip, but the majority of that is locked up. Uh, if you were to look at it on paper on the on the balance sheet, it looks like twenty million USD, but it's not in liquid funds, so that's really not that accessible. And a lot of that we're staking into nodes. In terms of fiat cash, that old school cash dollar. Uh, we have about 600k uh, AUD sitting there. Uh, and that's sort of for operational purposes. And then when it comes to the sale that we ran, uh, it's finalized and closed off at about the 2.5 million USD mark. And yeah, so if you bring all that together, it's a good, it's, you know, it's good, um, you know, ammo in the treasury for us to just make next year uh, an incredible year. Uh, except at the same time, you really have to look at sort of what's liquid, liquid, what's not liquid, and what what can we work off in real time to then sort of apply to the growth of the project. Uh, and then when it comes to the sort of second part of that, which is yeah, going back to the runway goal, um, pretty big. I, I want us to have in the treasury, you know, somewhere in between fifty to one hundred million dollars US. Uh, and I know that sounds quite large and and sort of you know, it is what it is, but what I want to do is continue to grow the team, prepare to scale, set up sort of probably another office in the, in the world as well to sort of position the project optimally and yeah, really, really expand and use that sort of momentum to, um, so for instance, with the session application, we're at this point where we're going to be hitting a million very shortly. And from there, we're, we're going to sort of hit product market fit and the, the costs involved with um sort of expanding or like taking those use numbers to 10x and then expanding into like different areas for the application we really need a lot of sort of ammo and treasury just to make us not have to take pause and, and sort of you know check every dollar but to be able to just achieve what we're looking to do so it's just going to help us with momentum and that's how i said uh so chris you talked a little bit there about the recent uh raising of funds some people are asking why exactly did the team need to raise funds? Some people are calling it a second ICO. What do you think? Yeah, I wouldn't call it that. Uh, yeah, so we had the necessity to raise funds because we didn't want to be reliant on chain flip. Um, moving to a layer two in itself is a bit of a costly exercise and we need to have a good amount of momentum to be able to achieve that effectively in the time frame that we're looking to do it in as well. So it was also a bit of a good opportunity to bring on sort of third parties who can help support us uh, sort of in the transition. For instance, there's a few Web3 projects that we've been able to sort of have a chat with and, and it looks like we'll be able to work with them in the future as well. And that will really help us sort of, um, you know, take the product and move into a layer two to a new level much faster as well. So it's really on multiple levels, it's been helpful. A for capital, uh, so like having money in the bank for momentum, not being dependent on chain flip and also bring on other third parties to help us accelerate uh, in terms of the actual build as well. Um, so Jason, speaking of flip, why can't the OPGF just sell its flip to secure that runway? And if we're not going to sell it, what exactly are we going to use it for? 
So the the vast majority of our flip is locked up, um, but we are able to use it for staking. And so if you look at uh, the OPTF staking nodes, we currently have 15. We're going to be bringing five more online very shortly. But our our goal with that is to earn revenue from staking flip and to use that to bolster the project. Uh, long term, it's a decision of when we want to sell that flip to support the project versus keep it invested in chain flip nodes. And that's a decision we'll make as time goes by. One thing though, is that we don't want to be, uh, there, there's still a lot of uncertainty. This is cryptocurrency. This is, you know, flip. We don't know what the price is going to be uh, a year from now. And so all the other things we're doing are trying to give us a secure, solid base so that we're not totally dependent on chain flip. So we want to use it to, to bolster what we can do but we don't want it to be our only lifeline. Okay, this question is about the token swap program. So Josh, is there gonna be a way to change the Ethereum address that is originally used for the points program? And if you can change it, what will the deadline be for changing it? Um, no, you're completely locked in to, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. You, you'll definitely be able to change um the ethereum address it'll be similar to the to the chain flip airdrop where um in that you had i think it was like up to like a week or two weeks before tge you were able to change your address to to be something else if you if you had a different wallet or you lost your keys or whatever it was even after that deadline period jason had yeah. people hitting him up I had about five or six <laughs> people who messaged me with proofs afterwards to get updated so yeah. yeah yeah and then he just had to manually go in there and do that so you're definitely going to have an opportunity um to change the address before the tg will run it pretty similarly we'll probably set the deadline to be like a week or two um before then definitely do it before the deadline because i'm sure jason doesn't have fun um going in and manually changing it but yeah that's 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 essentially it. you'll be able to and if you ask him nicely, maybe he will if you miss the deadline. But, but I, mean, to... <laughs> I had someone who wanted me to change it literally the last minute, like one minute before we were trying to send it out. And I had to say, sorry, that you're, you're too late. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I think he, he ultimately had it. It was just a preference thing. So please don't do that. That makes my life yeah. so stressful. Yeah. Another note on that is uh, don't leave it to the last minute to... Uh, put an address in the form as well, um, because the way that we're running it is if you have been running your node since September the 25th, uh, you'd been, you have been kind of earning points uh, up until now. And if you don't sign up before December the 31st or January 1st, see the one of those, um, then you won't actually get backdated with your points. So if you're running a service node um, already, then make sure you get your address in now so we can backdate those points for you. After um, December the 31st, we won't be able to do that anymore. So even if that just means you need to chuck an Ethereum address in there that you don't use that much and then update it before the TGE occurs, that's fine as well. Um, but make sure you get your address in there so that we can backdate your awards. Uh, so Key, is Session Token going to work on a layer two or will we be paying Ethereum fees and dealing with its wait times? No, so Session will be on a layer two. Um, we're pretty deep in some discussions with uh, some of the larger L2s and we'll announce that um, coming up. But yeah, most of the trading, like nearly all of the smart contracts will exist on the L2. We'll probably issue the token on the Ethereum layer one so that if the L2 goes down, we can move things around if needed. But all of the important contracts will be on the L2, um, meaning that when you stake, unstake, receive rewards, um, do ONS, um, all of that kind of stuff will be on the L2, so you won't need to wait. And when you do transfers as well between um, individual accounts, the fees will be really low on that as well. So, yeah. And Jason, this relates to the service node bonus. Can I sign or verify, or sign and verify, uh, my address from the Oxen Android wallet? Unfortunately, no. Um, the it's kind of the signing verify function in the wallet has it, it's probably something that the vast majority of people have only used before once to register for the, the chain flip airdrop. And now we'll use it a second time for this one. And because it's just such a rarely used thing, uh, it never entered the mobile wallet, which doesn't have all of the capabilities. So if you have your account on a mobile wallet, please, please make a backup of your seed if you don't already and use that with 
either the desktop wallet or if you're like me, the command line wallet. Uh, key, since Oxen is moving to ERC20 and it's not gonna have a native wallet anymore, I'll need a wallet. Will hot wallets like Edge, Trust, or Exodus work fully with session token or otherwise what hot wallets would be recommended to work fully with the project going forwards? Yeah, so the fantastic thing about moving to an ERC20 token is that you can essentially use any wallet that supports ERC20 tokens. I know that there's a few wallets out there that kind of you need to be manually whitelisted um, in the wallet. So with those ones, it could be a little bit uh, tricky until we get um, whitelisted on them. But like, I mean, just listing off, I mean, the most popular wallet in the world is MetaMask and you'll be able to use MetaMask seamlessly. Um, with sent um, and you'll also be able to use all of the hardware wallets that you've been able to use because those can be connected to metamask um, to, to hold your well you hold your private keys on the device and then you connect it to metamask to do your transactions that also means like <clears throat> something we've been using in the office like a little bit now that we've been dealing with flip and stuff is um, gnosis like which allows you to kind of set up different multi-sigs um, you know ten of two of three or ten of five you know like different types of multi-sigs and you'll be able to use all of that um with scent the other wallets edge wallet trust wallet um you should be able to use those with scent as long as they don't kind of have a white whitelisting program um, but we'll go through those whitelists anyway it may just take a little bit of time uh, let me just add i'm really looking forward to not maintaining the oxen wallet anymore um, i think you know you look out of the ecosystem in terms of ethereum and l2 supporting wallets and there are lots of nice wallets out there that are better than our wallets. Yeah. I don't have a problem saying that. So Jason, will KYC be required for staking, withdrawing funds, or just running a node in general in the future? No, this is all smart contract based. So, I mean, I can't promise that you're, you're going to be able to get the funds on an exchange without some sort of KYC. Um, that's sort of, the way the world is working, but that's not anything that we are ever going to care about or require. We're just putting out uh, smart contracts, basically, that you can go to with your wallet, fulfill the smart contract to submit your stake, and you're good to go. We don't want to ever do any KYC. Um, and so, so no, there won't be. Just another uh, point on that uh, as well. Um, one of the fantastic things about moving to kind of the EVM or the Ethereum ecosystem is that we'll now have access to decentralized liquidity pools as well. So previously, you know, when you wanted to obtain Oxen, you'd need to go to an exchange, usually a centralized exchange. Um, and a lot of those centralized exchanges require that you have KYC to be able to um, purchase Oxen tokens. Um, now what you'll be able to do is if you have Ethereum on the Ethereum chain or any other asset on the Ethereum chain, um, you can essentially purchase uh, session tokens through a, a DEX like Uniswap, or you'll be able to bridge to the L2 and purchase um, on the on the DEX there as well. So it gives a lot more options for people who are already hooked into the Ethereum ecosystem, which is like, you know, majority of people who use crypto these days. Um, and with more of the cross chain stuff coming through as well, like chain flip and floor chain, you'll actually be able to, you know, go from Bitcoin into the um, Ethereum ecosystem and then purchase cents. So yeah, it's really going to open us up um, to a bunch of different decentralized exchange options. And I think it's going to give um, people the ability to, to purchase auction without, um, you know, going through all of these hoops that uh, centralized exchanges set up for you. I mean, I think the one place, like the one use case where you might, encounter KYC is not you're already in crypto and you're coming to to send it's I'm sitting here with fiat cash and I need to get into crypto in the first place that's where the key KYC stuff is happening it's way outside anything that we can do anything about um so to the extent that we have control over stuff there won't be KYC so speaking of KYC and centralized exchanges and session token Josh is the OPTF working or will it work with any centralized exchanges to have session token listed at TGE? If so, which ones are they? Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we're not working on it right now. It's still, you know, way too early to be thinking about that kind of stuff. We're still just working through the transition. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll make sure by by TGE that we have a bunch of exchanges lined up similar to Flip. As for which exchanges exactly, um, 
well, it's it's too early to say right now. But even if it wasn't too early, I I doubt we would be able to say anything anyways, because these things are always notoriously tied up um, in NDAs. What would be nice to say, um, you know, we're, we're talking hypothetically down the line when this happens, it would be nice to be able to say something like, you know, we've lined up a, a new exchange or something like to just kind of say, like, we have locked in a new thing. Um, I'd love to be able to do that. But again, I'd, I don't know. It really depends on them. A lot of the times they're really tight lipped with this stuff and it's it's kind of out of our hands. But in my ideal scenario, I'd love to be able to be able to give updates with like we've locked in a new person. We can't say who it is, but we've locked in a new exchange for TG, that kind of thing. But who knows? You know. One of the one of the obstacles that we have faced is because we are on a, our own chain with our own wallet, listings has been um, quite difficult to get and quite expensive to get. Um, once we're on uh, in the EVM space, um, it, it's much much easier to get listings, much easier for them to list us, and much cheaper for us to get listings, which are all advantages in just getting more centralized exchange listings out there. The, the other thing that I want to say about exchanges as well is like, yes, centralized exchanges are really important and we want to go for those uh, listings on TGE. So we can kind of build up, um, you know, interest around uh, session token and allow people who may not be, uh, are not in the DeFi world to be able to obtain um, session tokens. But, uh, you know, moving to the EVM space also allows us to explore the entire world of decentralized exchanges. And obviously, this is something that we're a little bit biased towards, but stuff like Chainflip, um, for example, um, can have amazing use cases to bridge people who are already in crypto. Um, so I know Chainflip's going to have um, the, they, they have a thing called Axelar um, that they're integrating into them. And Axelar essentially connects other EVM chain, the Cosmos chain, a few other different um, chains. And basically what that's going to allow you to do is go from one of the native assets on Chainflip, like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, well, for Ethereum, it doesn't matter so much, but say, for example, Bitcoin, and you'd be able to swap that into Chainflip um, and then go through Axelar and access any ERC20 token. That'll basically go through Uniswap on the last step. <laughs> Um, so we will be able to get access um, through Chainflip to a bunch of different, um, you know, kind of native assets as well. Um, and I think the deck space is growing and and very interesting for on-chain volumes as well. Chris, can you provide a little bit more detail about what exactly the session ecosystem and community fund is? Yeah. So in the past, we've always felt like there was, uh, you know, we didn't have enough tokens or there wasn't tokens allocated to supporting the community and helping the community thrive uh, in terms of you know, bounties, programs, rewards, social media, marketing activities, uh, builder programs, research programs, all that kind of stuff. So those that, that token allocation is specifically for those sort of activities and it will be released over time as well. So it doesn't unlock in day one, it's sort of a slow release year on year uh, for five plus years. So that's the, the, the key sort of purpose of those tokens. Uh, and should really help with community sort of engagement and growth. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Like um, one of the things that we'll probably use uh, the tokens in that program for is like uh, Gitcoin bounties or development bounties as well. Like that's something that we ran successfully early on in the project, but I think then it kind of became like a little bit hard to source funds to that. And that, that ecosystem um, bucket is specifically for um, stuff like that, building the development community, building kind of, um, you know, natural interest around the coin, rewarding people who are the most active people on social media. Um, you know, you've seen little tidbits of that um, throughout the history of Oxen, um, but we're trying to bring that to a larger scale and, and be able to do that in a more formal way. Another question about that ecosystem and community fund specifically around the size. So why did we choose to have that allocation be at that size. Um, put bluntly, why would Oxen holders prefer to have tokens in this community fund rather in their own wallets? I feel like when you're when you're looking at a crypto project and you're looking at its momentum and sort of what is pushing engagement, um, just having tokens, staking tokens, and and utilizing the utility of session token is one thing, and that that should be pretty awesome. But when it comes to what we're trying to do with like momentum and engagement, 
that is why this is kind of good. This is what brings people to a project. It's sort of uh, the goal is to use it as a tool to magnetize more users to the platform, to the ecosystem, rather than you know give it like you know, distributing it all now and then there's sort of nothing to just keep the engagement up. So it's more of a long term view. And if you yeah, if you're just thinking, oh, what am I going to get in six months or what's the next six months going to look like? then this is, you know, like, what's the point of this concept? But really, we take a long-term view on this and how do we continue to make sure that the ecosystem is supported and growing long-term in those different ways? Yeah, it's also, it's also you want to have, like, an engaging and, and thriving community and ecosystem. That's, that's generally what you're trying to build up, right? So the whole point of this is to, to have the community engage with certain things, whether they're like bug bounties or on social media and be able to reward them for doing that. And it just creates, it creates the, the, a kind of vibe that you want for the community where everyone's like working together. Everyone's like, you know, earning rewards together rather than, you know, sitting around and doing nothing. Right. Like that's, that's not really fun for anyone. Yeah, I think we saw this play out like um, pretty, or this narrative play out pretty successfully with the the two kind of maybe most direct uh, programs that we ran. So like with Ox and Knights, which we ran a few years ago, that was really great for the community and really like pushed people onto Twitter. And there was a lot more activity on Twitter around Oxen at that point in time. Uh, and the other program that we ran quite successfully was the Gitcoin um, grants program. And that actually brought in a few developers who who have stayed with us, you know, for multiple years past the Gitcoin system. So it's not just about, you know, uh, paying people in tokens essentially to to stick on with you. Sometimes it's just about kind of getting people interested um, by saying, you know, here's a reward for for doing this particular thing. And then once they're into the project, they actually realize, oh, this is like what these guys are doing are really cool. Like I want to stay in this ecosystem and keep developing here. So. Um, I think that's a lot of it as well. Chris, will the team members be getting an allocation of session token? And if so, what is the vesting schedule? Yes, uh, there is a team allocation for session token. It will contain a three year lockup. Uh, so it's the biggest, longest lockup that there is. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of the actual schedule, so it's completely locked for you know 12 unlocks on the 13th month and then uh, starts unlocking um three point something percent each month after that for two years so yeah it's, it's quite a long drawn out lockup uh, and so it, it, it's sort of a commitment to the project for us as well we're taking this long-term view uh we, we, there's a long-term lockup to that as well why is there a forced lockup for a year i believe this is referring to the tokens from the service node bonus we are being coerced to into a lockup under threat of dilution what do you have to say chris yeah, I want to get rid of that, actually. Uh, I've been taking a lot of feedback from the community, and we really want to support the community and node operators especially. So, yeah, we're, we're looking to just scrap that and just support the community much better and, and just listen to the feedback. It seems like a good idea. And why was it that that lockup actually existed in the first place? The reason why we put the lockup on the node bonus was to make sure there was consistency as we transition across to the layer two. Um, but we we see that there's you know a bit of feedback on that one, and we've sort of uh, looked at it in different directions, and it does seem like something that we should reconsider. Uh, we're listening to the community, and yeah, we're looking at options now. So stay tuned, and we look forward to you know updating everyone on what, what we can do there. How many oxen coins does the OPTF currently hold? Even though we're not going to be participating in the swap, people are just interested in what our holdings actually are. So our current holdings are 7.9 million oxen. Um, you know, good chunk of that is in uh, stake nodes and then in various other wallets. So uh, just put that in perspective, that's about 12% of current circulating supply. And then just to reiterate, we've already said elsewhere, that is not going into the either the bonus program or the token swap. So, Chris, why did the OPTF choose not to participate in the token swap, but instead award itself that 25% allocation for the treasury? Yeah, easy. I'd like to break that into two sort of separate concepts there. One is we don't want to claim the tokens to make sure that the sort of service node operators and you know people who are trying to 
transfer across the session token can maximize their rewards. And it can, you know, that would be really good on that side. But when it comes to the foundation and that 25%, uh, to sort of break that down to a few different areas, um, a good portion will be set for service node operating. Uh, a good portion will be for um, sort of like only a small portion of that total will be released year on year. Uh, so the majority will be in nodes and a small portion will be for sort of liquidity and exchanges and stuff like that as well. Uh, I think I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but really it's sort of broken down to smaller pieces and it's also divided out over time. We're going to go into much more detail on this over the coming couple of days as well with sort of a breakdown on this and, and the release schedule. Uh, and we'll go a bit more detail onto sort of where and how that's going to be applied as well. But it's... Yeah, looking at it as twenty five percent on TGE, that's it's not going to be it's not going to be liquid on TGE. Great. And speaking of being liquid at TGE, I'm very interested to hear how you answer this question, Jason. With the current Oxen blockchain, it would take forty years to emit enough Oxen to achieve a circulating supply of two hundred forty million. Why should Session Token have this supply of two hundred forty million? Why should it be so large? Um. Well, first off, it will take a very long time for a circulating supply of cent to get to 240 million as well. So there is a substantial amount of a lockup, even in the 40 million rewards portion, where our, our tentative plan, and I don't know if this number has been locked in yet or not, but our plan is that um, that reward pool will emit about 14% a year. So when you actually go and work out the math it's going to take several years to even pay out half of, uh, of that amount um, various other things here are locked up for a substantial amount of time and as, and as chris said we'll go into more details on how all those lockups are going to work but in terms of what the actual circulating supply is going to be on day one um, a lot of people are focused on on this dilution and saying oh well i'm going to be so diluted from whatever portion I have to you know, only 25%. But the reality is so much of the stuff is locked up in terms of day one circulating supply, you'll actually have a lot more than the, than the dilution as a portion of that 240 million would seem to imply. Um, the other thing I'll add, you know, the, the 240 million, we're, this, this token swap isn't one-to-one. -one. So I don't think it's fair to say is 240 million oxen would take this amount of time. Why is the cent um, 240 million? We were never aiming to say one oxen equals one cent. And if you go and do the math on terms of what you get in the service node bonus or in the, the flip, it does not come out to one to one. Uh, and it's not meant to. We simply wanted to pick numbers that when we are thinking about this in the future and saying, here's our token economics, we have a reasonably round numbers to work with that are fairly easy to explain, um, not one-to-one. -one. So uh, that's a bit of a false comparison there. Um, so key, will ONS registrations be preserved after the migration to session token? Uh, yeah, short answer, yes. Uh, long answer, also yes. Um, there's some complications um, with some of the older names that have been registered because they've been registered under kind of a different hashing uh, schemes. Like there's different kind of levels that we've done as ONS has changed over time. Um, so some of them may require like kind of an active migration, whereas others may be migrated automatically. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of like what we can do on the smart contract design um, there. So there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes to try and work out how we can do that, that as seamlessly as possible. Um, but yeah, the, the goal is to migrate every registered name um, over to the to the EVM blockchain so that, you know, if you have um, key, key dot Loki or, you know, key as the session name, then you'll still have that name on the Ethereum side of things, even though you may need to claim that name um, back, it'll still be owned by you. Do, does someone out there have key? Dot Loki and key? <laughs> yeah, Other probably Chris, Chris probably bought it, you know, to sell back to me. I'm pretty sure Chris has Jason. Um, <laughs> just to elaborate on what Key was mentioning there, like in very early days, uh, we actually used a very expensive hash function on the blockchain. Um, those are actually going to break probably shortly, probably before we even transition to Scent. 
Um, but they break in the sense that you can't use them, but you still own them. So you could always go submit an update to just put the name back in and reset it onto the modern hashing that we use. But uh, it's re relatively small number. And I think that transition was two years ago, maybe more. Key, the first item listed in the plan for session token is for it to be able to transact and pay for premium features in session. What is the progress on actually implementing the capability to spend session tokens in app? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that um, question in a few different directions. So bear with me because I'll circle back to the answer in the end. Um, so first I want to start with session monetization and where that's actually at. Um, so we we have some really good uh, UI mockups now for the first features that will go into session monetization. And I think we've, we've talked about that a little bit to the community. Probably that's going to look like um, badges for donation and support to the session project. Um, so that's kind of our initial MVP. We can get all of the payment systems into the application so that people can actually, um, you know, spend session tokens or donate, donate fiat currency, and then they receive this badge uh, for doing so. so. That's kind of the first thing that we'll be looking to put in uh, regarding monetization. And we're hoping to get that in kind of mid next year. Um, around that time. In terms of in-app payments, um, using the session token in-app, um, that will require a wallet integration uh, into the, the session application, um, or um, you know, we could also imagine a situation where people would be able to pay uh, for features that they can kind of import into the session um, application, paying through an external wallet. Either way, both of those things become way easier than they previously were with Oxen because integrating an Oxen wallet into an application was very tricky, um, not just from a technical perspective because the wallet technology isn't as good with Oxen, but also from a fundamentals perspective because you need to sync the blockchain, all of this kind of other stuff that comes along with privacy coins, whereas with uh, kind of a, an EVM based um, coin, a lot of that goes away. So actually bringing a wallet into the session application becomes a lot easier. And I think once that wallet is in the application, we will definitely offer an option in the application to pay for session premium, session pro rather, um, using the session token. Um, so there's a lot of steps that we kind of have to take to get to that point. And then there's some kind of workarounds that we can put that in as well. Like we don't just want to allow people to pay for premium session token. We also want to allow for other payment methods as well. You know, using your Apple and Google Pay and maybe um, some other cryptocurrencies as well. Um, but yeah, th those are kind of the steps that it would take to get session uh, token inside of the application and paying for premium. Great. Okay, so Josh, this question is a big one and it's really something to chew on here. What will the team do differently this time to avoid the failures of Oxen? Oh, big question. Big question. Um, well, I think uh right now this this transition that we're doing right now is a really big part of us trying to avoid previous failures and and learn from past mistakes i mean it's it's the reason why we put more in the treasury this time is because multiple times in the past we've had these big opportunities um for like big partnership opportunities which i feel like i can talk about them now because they didn't go through but we signed ndas so all I can say is we had we had multiple like big um, uh, partnership opportunities that were the kind that you you want in the space. They they could cause like that frothy, exciting environment. But we've had them fall through uh, right at the last second because we just didn't have enough tokens to entice them. Like we didn't have an, an, enough uh, tokens to give them to entice them for them to have skin in the game and be part be part of the project with us. So like ha having that limitation on us has i think really hurt the project in the past and i mean if you look at the 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 top 100 coins barring like bitcoin and the ogs you i think you'll find a lot of them have a uh, a larger treasury because it gives them options in terms of when it comes to making these kind of partnerships which is just something that we've always been limited to we've kind of been between a rock and a hard place so you've got you know the the space completely moving away from you but you don't have the funds or the treasury to to cause any kind of interest with other parties it's just a really hard situation to be a part of and it's not like we're trying to be greedy and take this all for ourselves as well because we're a foundation 
so we we literally can't the the funds do have to go back into the project so it just creates a a more beneficial situation for the for the entire project for the entire ecosystem everyone involved um so fixing up the the tokenomics which is what we're trying to do now fixing a lot of these fundamental issues that have caused a blocker for us that we continually come against is one of the biggest things that we're trying to fix right now with this transition um so yeah i i would say that's that's probably the the biggest thing that we're trying to avoid right now the other thing off the top of my head that i can think of is um and again it's it's to do around the the coin side of things but um you know the 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 space really moved away it was a different time when we created this project protocol coins were the the rage um but the space really did move on you know it moved on to DeFi. it moved on to erc20 um and so i think keeping our token more in line with where the the um, industry is and where things are going will be important for us to do in the future. It's something that we kind of, because a lot of our products sit off on the side here. We have a lot of really exciting and innovative privacy products. Um, but the coin is just something that we've never really put the development time into. You know, you look at Zcash, you look at Monero, like Vero, you look at all these other privacy coins, and the majority of their funding is going back into creating a privacy coin which is just not what we do. We create these privacy products. So, you know, having a coin that goes along with what the industry is doing it to make it, it easy for everyone to get involved, but that doesn't compromise the privacy of our products. I think that's another big thing as well, because otherwise you like we're in this situation right now, you kind of sit away from everyone else and it makes it a lot harder for you. Um, so those, those are the, the, the two big things that I can see us doing differently in the future. And we're already taking steps to doing that. That's what this entire transition between, you know, Oxen to Cent is all about. So, yeah, I can say from the, from the tech side, like one thing that I think has, has been a failure for us in the past and the mistake that we haven't um, kind of really acknowledged until the last couple of years is that we with session especially like we've been developing code for three different platforms um, three different times and that creates a lot of bottlenecks in the development process um, and it creates a lot of bugs as well when you're trying to communicate between different platforms um, an approach that we've started to take over the last year or so is to um, use kind of libraries um, to write common code in so if you have a piece of logic that's being executed on multiple different platforms um, sharing that logic in a library, writing it once, and then importing that into the other applications, I think is really important. And that's something that we've started to do. And I know a lot of community members like still think the development process is slow. Um, I'll just say like a lot of that has been because we have been bringing a lot of functionality into these libraries over the last uh, year or so, backporting a lot of stuff. It doesn't look like there's as much forward moving progress, but we're putting ourselves in a really good position so that when the transition actually happens um, to the session token, that we're ready to really um, push development pace much faster in 2024. And that'll also come with a lot of um, additional resources that we've, we've gotten from uh, raising additional funds for the foundation. Um, and also, you know, the chain flip stuff going really well, um, really positively positions us there as well. Um, so I think that's one of the things on the development side that I'm really excited about, that we've kind of recognized one of our mistakes and we're moving forward on that. Yeah, something that I'm kind of excited about, and I guess a lesson learned is that when you're doing things with that momentum, it really sort of makes things like quite difficult and you don't really get to where you want to get to within a reasonable amount of time and then people don't appreciate it. It creates this sort of catch-22 of negativity. Um, but one thing that we've made a really specific um, sort, of, sort of push towards is focusing in different areas getting as much momentum as we can say for, for session for instance um, getting as much momentum and growth in that area and sort of cutting things that we don't really need and sort of that concept of killing your babies it's a it's a really painful challenge to do sometimes like you've built we've built blink we spent so much time doing this and we spent so much time on oxygen and we we've done all these things but really they're not getting the momentum that we need and if we don't get the momentum see you later so we've it's it's a tough thing to do to go like okay we have to put that down we have to put that down we need to focus here and focus there um but i think that we've 
really come together and we've put our sort of egos aside and and as a team i think that we are able to be like okay great like we see this path we see this path is a good path and we've come together and as a team i feel like we're the most united we've probably ever been as well i would say at least it feels like from my perspective i feel like our trust and our ability to communicate across the different teams and with each other as a team has really uh, grown to a point where we can say things and and sort of move through challenges a lot better as well. So I think us as a team, that's been a massive improvement. I think how we focus has improved and there's sort of ch different challenging points. And I think that with the token transition, it's going to open up a lot of doorways for the project to then scale and, and continue to do some really cool shit. So they're kind of my my three sort of main lessons and, and, and problems that we've solved. And I think that there's a lot of groundwork in doing that. But once you've done the groundwork, you just set yourself up for a really positive momentum. I've got a couple points to add to what Key and Josh said, or Key and Chris said here. Um, uh, no, I, I think that from a software development point of view, the direction that we're on in session is a fantastic one. I think that it's, like Key said, it's, yeah, it's slowing us down in the short run, but it's going to let us go faster and better and more bug free uh, in the long in the longer term. Um, we're, we're, I'm also really, I, I mean, I'm really proud with how we're doing on the session side. I, I think that from my point of view, internally looking at how our software development is working, it's working, it's working really well. Um, it hasn't always been the case, uh, but right now it's, it's, it's great. Uh, and the same is true on the Lokinet side. We're spending a lot of time this year on dealing with kind of long-term issues that have been there in Lokinet to try and get this thing in a place that it's, that it's sustainable, that we can keep developing it, that we can make it rock solid. Um, and so I think um, when you look back at this year, you'll say, oh, things looked like they were slow, but that's because we're down there in the weeds, really cutting up the weeds uh, and and making things um, making things amazing, laying the groundwork for the future. Also, like last thing I want to add, I'm, I, 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 I I'm personally sad that we're moving away from Blink because that was like the first major thing I worked on in the project. But like Chris said, we never had that traction. And at some point we've got to say, we've got to move away from it. Great. Uh, so this question, I'm a little bit confused about it, to be honest with you, but I'll see if you have an answer for it, Chris. Why isn't the 1.6 million flip that was sold this year going towards service node operators? Excellent. So uh, to clarify, it was actually 1.6 million USD worth of flip. Uh, and I think it was sold last year. It wasn't sold this year. Uh, so you have bills to pay. We have 24 people operating and our burn rate is around 1.6 million USD. So we, we, I guess we could just stop doing everything and just like cease. Uh, but we chose not to do that. And we chose to continue building because what what value does the does a service node network have if there's nothing running on it? Uh, so, yeah, we we chose to uh, just continue to operate as an organization and continue to grow and build. And I think that was the better choice. Um, although I love and definitely think we should and we are supporting the service node operators and service node network. Uh, I think that it's more important that there's something. Uh, that's actually operating than giving out all the money really quickly and then having nothing at all. Excellent. All right, Jason, what is the significance of the 25th of September, 2023? Why is that when we started the snapshot and would we consider doing a different day, like the day that ORC 8 went out or something like that? If essentially we sat down around that time and said, we want to we want to work out um, something that rewards existing service node holders, um, but that also balances that against keeping things, keep, um, keeping service node operators into the network going into the sent transition. So we didn't want to say, okay, the, the timer start, starts today, despite the fact that we have all these service node operators, uh, some of whom have been running at a loss we we really wanted to keep them in we wanted to give them a little extra and so why that day in particular well that was the day after we had the discussion or maybe a few days after we had the discussion when i set the thing up and started uh, taking the snapshots 
as to why we wanted to do it, well, like you said, we, we want this balance. Um, now, I think at this point that date is probably locked in because we've announced it, because people may have taken action to go out and um, acquire additional um, oxen in order to run service nodes for that service node bonus. But the, you, you know, we, we, we're, I, I suppose we could consider a possibility of changing that. But if we do, it's really going to depend on how long this program goes, because we want there to be, like I said, that balance. So if we go according to schedule and, you know, sometimes in Q2 is when, when this transition happens, we think that's a reasonable balance between rewarding the guys who were there with a couple of extra months of points versus rewarding new people who come in to participate in the program. But things may change if if this uh, happens, you know, if it extends much beyond Q2, which I really don't, I really hope it won't, and I, I don't think it will. But if it if we go through this like extended period until it happens, then we might consider rebalancing it by looking at earlier points. But that's going to have to be something that we do really carefully, uh, and trying to keep that balance and that concept of fairness in mind. Chris, is there any way to reduce the amount of tokens at TGE so that the Oxen community members are not diluted within the first year? Yeah, that's actually already the game plan in terms of tokens that will be uh, liquid in the first year. The majority will be the um, service node bonus tokens and the Oxen to session token swap tokens. But we'll give like much more clarity over this over the next couple of days. Um, looking forward to releasing some more economic stuff. So any assumption that all these tokens are going to be unlocked first day and everyone's sort of getting squeezed out, that's just not the intention. Um, and we look forward to you know, dispelling a lot of the, that sort of fear, I guess. Yeah, pretty much all the other tokens will be locked. Right. But yeah. I don't want to get into more details because it's all good. Yeah, cool. We'll have some lovely uh, charts for you which show the supply over the first five years um, to give you some visual indication of how things are going to unlock over time. Chris, where do you see the session app user base being in one, three, and five years? Yeah, really cool. So I look at the past and I look at the present and I look at our competitors, and then it sort of lets me frame up sort of where we're probably going to be hitting over the next three to five years. So uh, for one of our goals of this year was hitting 1 million monthly active users, and I actually see us hitting that, which is really awesome. Uh, I've been telling people that we'll hit 1 million this year. And although you look at the numbers, it, just, it doesn't really add up. What you have to do is think about the features that we're adding, what that brings to the users and the user base, sort of the, the, the size of the user base is growing as well. Like the, the slice, the pie size of private messaging applications seems to be increasing because people are waking up to privacy. So uh, 1 million this year, let's go. I think we're going to hit it. And I, I've been saying this for quite some time. Uh, from there, I think that we've gone three to four X year on year, which is really nice. So the last three years have been three to four X year on year. Um, but the actual product itself is hitting sort of the inflection point for product market fit, at least from my perspective. And the value to a user in terms of using the application and bringing on communities and friends and families is um, kind of what I see not like, break, that's what I see breaking the trend of your three to four X growth and really hitting your 10 X growth in terms of new users. So we're up 1 million. I think we'll hit 10 by the end of next year. And if you also look at sessions growth, you see that there went, I think it was like 500,000, uh, 12 million, um, and then uh, like 40 million. You said, you said, yeah, you said session. Sorry, so sorry. If you look at signals growth, it went from 500,000 to about 12 million to 40-ish um, million. And yeah, that, that's kind of my sort of concept here is when you hit that product market fit and you actually um, are giving a lot of value to users and they're willing to drop other applications, be it Signal, WhatsApp, Telegram, or whatever, whatever they're using. Um, I think we'll hit 10 million quite nicely next year so is what I predict. Uh, and then from there, anything can happen. If you look at Signal, they went from you know 12 to I think 40 and we may go back to that three to four X trend as well. Uh, you know, I can't guarantee the future, but I think next year will be quite a substantial growth and then we'll probably head back to that three to four X growth. So it would seem like 10 million and then maybe 40 or, you know, go from there as well. No guarantees, but that's just how the competitors asked in our past and present seem to line up together. 
Um, so another question about that flip sale. Uh, first of all, there's there's four there's four parts to this question. Firstly, why were those tokens sold? Secondly, who were they sold to? So let's answer those, and then we'll circle back to the to the second the second two questions. Chris, cool. Why were the tokens sold? Uh, runway funding, make sure the project doesn't stop, and we can pay wages and continue to grow as an organization. That's the why, I guess. Uh, and then from the who were they sold to? Can't really go into those details. Uh, the sort of the NDA sort of activities. Uh, it wouldn't be right of me to, to start doxing those organizations. But you know, there were some organizations uh, at that time. Uh, was there any other questions in there? Sorry. Or yeah. So were we working on session token at the time that we sold those tokens? Uh, and how was the money which was raised through the sale of those tokens used for scaling growth and monetization yeah super easy so in terms of at, at that point in time i don't think we were looking at session token that was over a year ago we've always tossed up the idea but that doesn't mean we we're going to do it uh, even like it, we, we thought oh yeah th these are challenging points of the project these are high friction points and we've thought or oh, should we cut these? And we sort of argued them. We'd argue pretty brutally about different things to do. Um, but it wasn't decided at that point in time. It was sort of lightly discussed in different ways. Uh, in terms of how did the money get used into, for scaling growth and monetization, since then, we have been scaling. We've gone from um, at the start of the year, like 200,000 monthly active users to nearly a million now, or you know, publicly we'll announce something later. But, like we're doing well with those numbers. Those numbers have scaled. That is an undoubt undoubtedly have we grown the application. Undoubtedly has the application improved tremendously over the last 12 months. In terms of monetization, we need to do those things to then monetize the application. It's it's sort of a no-brainer. We can't monetize without the users, nor can we do that without it being uh, a scalable, a reliable application. So yeah, we've definitely gone down that direction and we've um, hired more people we've brought on more people uh skilled developers and yeah we, that that's how um does that yeah. is there any other spicy bits you guys want to add to that does that make sense no I, I, just, I just think like the the focus the focus is definitely on uh getting the users for session is getting session to the point where you know it's starting to generate like a larger user base because to monetize like a small user base just doesn't it just it, it doesn't make sense like and then when you start bringing in monetization to at too early a stage you cut out potential new users from coming to the platform so i think the 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 goal is to create make the app as good as we can make it build it to the point where it's got product market fit so you can get that large user base to then be able to monetize that your blog post says over two million US dollars of session tokens have been sold at a price of twenty cents. Can you be more specific about how much specifically has been sold? Chris. So it's somewhere in between two to two point five. Uh, until that's been finalized, I can't really be more specific. That's kind of the, the challenge there. Um, but yeah, it's somewhere in that range of two to two point five. Once that's completed, then it would probably be two point five. But right now, all I can say is more than two. Um, how can you justify that existing oxen holders are being diluted to 25% of the session token supply? That is for you, Key. Yeah, and I think that kind of comes down to the essential question that a lot of people have a lot of frustration about is, is this um, idea of the, the dilution. So I think the first point to, to cover is that on, on day one, uh, of the supply when the scent token launches the majority of the supply and when i say majority here um, we'll work out the exact numbers and we'll give those to you in a couple of days we're just going through the charts and stuff now to show you how it unlocks over over um, time but essentially the majority of the supply will be owned by people who have swapped oxen tokens or who have gotten the service node bonus um, so that is going to be you know a very very large portion of the supply on day one so those people who are coming from Oxen, who own the majority of the Oxen supply right now, are coming over to a coin where they still own majority of the supply. It's not 25%, it's gonna be you know, way higher number than that. Then we have to talk about, okay, well, what's, what's gonna happen over the next five years? 
over the next five years, we need to bring in ecosystem partners. We need to bring in new people into the ecosystem. We need the foundation to have more tokens than it previously had because we missed out on a lot of opportunities because the foundation didn't have enough treasury beforehand. So with those two things, we need, we do need to increase the token supply. I understand that that's uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, and you know, it's uncomfortable for a lot of us as well. Like we had a lot of internal argumentation about this before it actually, um, occurred, but it is the only way to be able to secure the project into the future, into the next 10 years, um, of the project. And that's just, that's what we're going to have to do. The way that that releases over time though, is very slowly and in a very, um, structured process to ensure that the people who do get those tokens get them at the right time to be able to incentivize the project to move forward so bringing on new ecosystem partners will help us for the next year or two um, as we grow and scale session or as we look for those kind of larger exchange listings and stuff like that and having the foundation well positioned as well means that we'll be able to move things forward um, when those partnership opportunities come along to us um, so yeah i definitely understand where the frustration is coming from and i understand why people um aren't happy about that but it, it's just the way that we have to move forward and the very last question that i think we'll have time for for today we've been here for a number of hours now uh if i registered my wallet for the airdrop program but moved some coins to another wallet which is not registered will the accrued points from the registered wallet still count towards the airdrop and that question is for you key yes um so points that you've earned don't go away like they're still earned and will be paid out to the ethereum address that you registered um an important note uh on that though is uh the way that we've kind of set things up is that if you're running a service node um at the time that tg occurs then you will be eligible for the points you earned and you'll also be eligible for the ox and token swap and that kind of all that process all happens automatically um, so the easiest way to do the migration for a service node is just to be running a service node when the session TG occurs. Um, otherwise, you'll kind of have earned these points for your service node and those will be paid out to your Ethereum address. And then you'll need to take your um, auction that presumably you've unstaked and move to a different wallet um, and then migrate that through the token swap as well. Um, so easiest way is just to keep service node running until TG, but um, you don't lose any points just because you unstake and move your auction to different addresses. You stop earning points if you do that, but anything, yeah. any points you've got, they, they're still there. Excellent. Well, I think that's pretty much all of the time that we will have today, gents, uh, for this AMA. Thank you, everybody, for your time and for tuning in. Thank you for sending in your questions. It's much appreciated. This discussion is going to be ongoing, I'm sure, like I mentioned before. I'm sure there's going to be more AMAs or other things that we're going to be doing to try and communicate with the community, make sure that everybody is on board and pushing forward in the same direction together. Um, but until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.